there, Captain. Okay, so hold on for a sec. The DC-3 was almost the very first NASA space shuttle. Yes, folks, you heard that correctly. This is in April Fools. That was actually a thing, and we're gonna learn a little bit more about that in a second. But not only that, the DC-3's had quite the crazy career over its 85 years. Yes, in fact, this aircraft design has been flying for almost 100 years. It will get to 100 years with some new mods that are going on this aircraft. Let's tie this all in and figure out why NASA almost shot a DC-3 in the space. Let's get into this, but in fact, it's a little cold here right now, so let's find somewhere that's just a little bit warmer. Okay, I've transported us back to the 1960s. The DC-3 has just turned 25 years old and it was only 60 years ago that the Wright brothers first flew, which means we've only been into aviation for 60 years and man has already set his sights on the stars. Yes, folks, we're gonna figure out how to get to space. The main problem with sending an astronaut into space was for him to return home safely. Most designers were focused on an aircraft-based design for re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. But on one coast-to-coast -coast flight on a DC-3, brilliant designer Max Forge came up with a simple solution based on the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. His idea turned into the Mercury spacecraft. The problem of overheating the spacecraft structure was overcome with a bell-type shape design that created a shock wave that forced the heat away from the hull. This simple design thought up while flying on board a DC-3 led him to think up a solution for his next major challenge. Now I'm getting the shuttle. Uh, the Apollo was so easy, I'm gonna completely skip that. <laughs> Instead of flying just one man into space, how are we going to fly a crew of astronauts and many tons of cargo into orbit? Max was unhappy with the designs NASA was receiving. He believed them to have an unacceptable amount of development risk. Upset by what he felt was a project that was doomed to fail, he started to work on his own design. For this, he turned to the DC-3. Yes, he used the DC-3's tried and true design to be the stepping stone for the very first shuttle prototype. The reasoning was the DC-3's basic fuselage design is perfect, and the wing shape and placement offered the ability to shift the center of gravity due to the changing designs and payload requirements. Max was becoming famous for his simple designs that did the job perfectly and only needed to innovate where absolutely necessary. Most other radical designs needed all new building materials, new processes, technologies, and full flight characteristic testing. Max's belief is that they had to tackle the new challenges that the space shuttle program was encountering, which was a host of new problems. Max's mercury capsule was more like a plum, and that plum had to go through the atmosphere. Now, with his DC-3 design, he's dealing with a watermelon. So that watermelon is now gonna have to go through the atmosphere and you can see the difference he was dealing with. The first major issue they had to address was up until that time, the fastest an aircraft had ever flown was Mach 6, which means basically six times the speed of sound. For this new design, the shuttle will be re-entering the Earth's atmosphere at its very first time at Mach 25. So let's step back for a second. Airplanes always start off at zero and reach their top speed. So if they have a problem, they can always slow down. The shuttle has an opposite problem. Here it is in Max's own words. I took one big dog went all the way from lot number six to lot Mach number 25. And of course, uh, if they got down to Mach number 23 or 20X or 19 or whatever it is and decided things were not too good, you couldn't back up to Mach 25 and try again. Another issue they had was the massive amount of heat that the aircraft would be subject to during re-entry. He took the extreme controversial stance of making the new shuttle out of traditional aluminum instead of titanium or even a new material.
This was a problem as aluminum softens greatly at 350 degrees Fahrenheit and re-entry it gets to a staggering 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. So how do you get an aircraft that's made out of aluminum in and out of space? And this is where all the crazy uh, rocket scientist stuff comes in. I'm not going to uh, explain like I know what I'm talking about, but there was innovations like the heating tiles and stuff that we're all familiar with uh, that were uh, surrounding the aluminum, including different types of ceramics and all that fun stuff. So I know exactly what you're thinking. Max's shuttle DC-3 is looking nothing like the iconic DC-3 that we remember. And you can kind of see why, because he started off with the base design and as problems came in, he adapted. So let's get to it. So, you know, the design's going good and uh, uh, Max is, you know, working for NASA. So he's, you know, the boss. So he is favoring his design, but there's also other designs. And towards the end, there was two basic camps. There was Max's camp with uh, the aircraft that had wings like a DC-3 or looked like a cargo plane. And then there was the Delta wing configuration. This is where it gets a little bit complicated because the Air Force actually picked the Delta wing configuration solely because it was better and more stable at high speeds, which means it can enter the atmosphere at a shallower level and actually hit its mark. And again, this is very, very complicated. The DC-3 type design with the wings had to go in at a 60 degree angle and this caused it to actually, you know, extend its range of going through the atmosphere, which put it at an unfavorable landing scenario. Hopefully that made sense. In 1971, NASA decided to go ahead with the Delta wing design. Max, years later, was still confident that his original DC-3 design was the original way to go. The Johnny Becker says this is a, a high-angle attack reentry vehicle. Does not enter as high an angle tight as I would like to see it do. Uh, I, th I think that uh, cross range is, is uh, not very important in designing a spacecraft, and, and we'd have been better off to design from the beginning for a lower cross range and perhaps better landing characteristics. And Max went on to work on the shuttle as well and develop it all the way through uh, to its first flight. The funny thing about its first flight, not its first space flight, but the very first shuttle was actually the shuttle Enterprise. And that's really the, my inspiration for making this video a little bit Star Trek-y is because I've been watching a lot of Star Trek while we're all in this uh, quarantine phase. And I thought, hey, I'm gonna do some research and I turned out to find the whole DC-3 connection. So I was super excited to come and tell you guys that whole connection. Max retired from NASA in 1981, right after the second flight of the space shuttle Enterprise. Man, we were so close. We could have had a space shuttle DC-3. Very, very cool. But Max, you know, he continued on helping the whole space industry until he sadly passed away in 2003. Uh, it's just amazing that such an iconic aircraft that means a lot to me and most likely to you uh, has, you know, influenced designers throughout the ages. And I kind of want to leave it a little bit here on what Max has to say about the future of design. I'll leave it up to him. And then if we have time, I'm going to go into some observations. I wouldn't really call them lessons because I'm not really sure that uh, the world changes so fast you ought to take too many lessons from the past. You ought to look ahead. So what's the future of the DC-3? Well, you're going to have to check out this video right here to see how this aircraft can fly to 100 years old. I want to thank you for joining us and uh, wherever in the world you are, live long and prosper. Bye.